You're very welcome to today's IIA webinar. I'm Seamus Allen, a policy researcher here at the IIA, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Jacob Mashangana, CEO of Justitia. Jacob is going to talk to us today about recent developments in online and free speech regulation. And the main topic today is the Digital Services Act. Jacob will speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll go into a discussion and a Q&A with you, our audience. You can join the Q&A using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So do send in questions as you think of them, and we'll come to them once Jacob has finished his presentation. Please do include your name and your organization name in your question. And a reminder that today's webinar and the Q&A are both on the record. Jacob, as I said, is the CEO of Justicia, which is a think tank in Denmark that deals with rule of law, human rights, and freedom of expression issues. And he also directs its future free speech project. He's an expert commentator in international media and international forums on issues relating to freedom of expression, human rights, and technology. He recently published his new book, Free Speech, A Global History from Socrates to Social Media, which I would really strongly recommend and which is really interesting and stimulating and insightful on a lot of these topics. And it really shows how the history of this topic is very, very relevant to a lot of contemporary debates and in some cases can be sound eerily familiar. So, Jacob, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you so much, Seamus. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to uh, to be addressing uh, this forum today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and uh, depending on your perspective, uh, that this is this is also a very good timing given giving developments over uh, the DSA and and you know the role of, of free speech uh, online, which is 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 hotly debated everywhere. Um, before sort of zooming more in on the free speech related aspects of the Digital Services Act, I think I want to start in. Uh, by by going back a, uh, a couple of decades to the 1990s, which is sort of the um, the high watermark of um, techno optimism or techno uh, utopian optimism, some might say, um, this idea that um, the the World Wide Web, uh, which was being democratized, um, would basically mean that. Um, freedom democracy would be spread to all corners of the world and that uh, old-fashioned censorship uh, would uh, no longer be relevant. And um, nothing more embodies this uh, zeitgeist than the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace from uh, 1996, uh, uh, authored by John Perry Barlow. And I, I want to quote for it. It says, Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. I declare the social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose on us. You have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any methods of enforcement. We have true reason to fear. We are creating a world where anyone, anywhere may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. So, so that is sort of this radically utopian um, and optimistic vision of what the internet would bring to free speech uh, online. Um, and I think in, in, in the, the following decade or so, um, techno-optimism was, was the norm. So... Obama came to power in, in the US um, using social media, using the internet to great effects, energizing younger voters with a positive message of change. Um, the Arab Spring was very much seen as um, uh, sort of, the, again, the embodiment of, of, of the positive uh, nature of social media that um, people in the Middle East who had for su such a long time been without a voice could suddenly mobilize, could speak out, could circumvent traditional censorship on uh, social media and topple uh, regimes that had been in power for, for decades. Um, but then there was a, a, a reversal of attitudes um, that uh, we're still living through, sort of skepticism, pessimism crept in. Uh, it may start have started with ISIS sort of um, and 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 terrorism, 
um, ISIS being able to coordinate, uh, spread its propaganda uh, online to recruit members online. Then came uh, Brexit. Um, then came the refugee crisis, where uh, uh, in, in Europe, where lots of hate speech uh, was spread online. And perhaps most importantly, the 2006 US presidential election, which was set to uh, have been uh, perhaps determined even by the spread of Russian disinformation and fa fake news that uh, supposedly decided it in favor of, for, of, of Donald Trump. And that led to a huge backlash against uh, social media platforms and, and skepticism about um, the potential of free speech. And suddenly free speech was seen perhaps more uh, as a threat than as a promise for democracies. And we saw a, a number of initiatives to rein in uh, free speech on social media. So the code of conduct on hate speech in, in 2016 um, between the European Commission and a number of, uh, of, of big tech platforms followed by a code of practice on disinformation. Then Germany actually became the pioneer in online regulation with its Nets DG law from 2017, which essentially obliged a uh, social network with more than 2 million users to remove illegal content, uh, manifest the illegal content within 24 hours of face uh, fines of up to 50 million euros, um, a, a, a law uh, an intermediate uh, liability law that that spread rapidly to uh, around the world, including, unfortunately, to countries like uh, Venezuela, Russia, and others who who were uh, delighted with a, a president drafted in in a European democracy. And now the Digital Services Act is uh, sort of hailed as the gold standard um, by the by, by by the European Union to to. Um, Create a rules ordered, um, uh, a rules based order in 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 cyberspace, uh, and one of the stated aim of the DSA is to set rules for a safe, predictable, and trusted online environment in which fundamental rights enshrined in the Charter are effectively uh, protected. And one of those rights, of course, is freedom of expression, uh, which includes the freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart information and ideas without interference by public authority regardless of frontiers, that follows from Article 11 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which again is to be interpreted in light of Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights um, as uh, authoritatively uh, interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights under the Council of Europe, not the European Union. The problem though is, you know, is the DSA uh, mostly focused on protecting this right or does it pose a threat to this right, even though it exp explicitly says that that the protection of this right is is part of its purpose, and I think um, to be fair, we're still very much in the initial stages of the implementation of the of the DSA. Not all parts have, have fully entered into uh, to 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 force, but I will um, color myself um, pessimistic uh, based on what we have seen so far. Um, and I'll highlight a number of risks that I see in the DSA. Um, one of them, or perhaps the biggest one, um, is um, the um, obligation on very large online platforms or VLOPs and very large online search engines to assess and mitigate uh, so-called systemic risks, which their services are deemed to generate uh, and or contribute to. Um, and these risks include, among other things, the dissemination of illegal content and um, the much broader actual or negative effects for the exercise of fundamental rights or on civic discourse and electoral processes and public security, but also public health. Um, so here we see that systemic risks relate not only to what is uh, illegal, but also what may, may be deemed um, lawful, but but harmful based on very broad um, definitions. Um, and um, of course, the enforcer of these systemic, systemic risk, the, the regulator, if you like, uh, is the European Commission, which seems to view free speech as more of a danger to be countered than a fundamental value to be uh, protected. And, and why do I say that? Um, well, um, Thierry Breton, the European Commissioner, um, who uh, is spearheading uh, the, the DSA has been very, very um, uh, prominent in his uh, promotion of the DSA and uh, his views on what 
DSA obligations entail um, very much seems to be uh, a harm-oriented approach. In other words, that uh, especially big tech pl platforms have to do much more to counter illegal hate speech. And I think uh, a, a more very recent example is uh, the fallout of, over the Israel-Hamas war, where Cherry Platon has sent letters to to X, to YouTube, Meta, and TikTok, demanding that these VLOPs uh, not only delete illegal content, content, um, but also disinformation, uh, and he's sort of given them 24-hour deadlines to respond to his letters, even though there's no um, there's no explicit um, uh, basis for him to demand. Uh, so, uh, since the 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 DSA does not prescribe 24-hour uh, uh, deadlines. And we've also seen a letter uh, from October 20th of this month with the commission urging member states to coordinate efforts to target illegal and harmful speech and essentially to act as a prolonged arm of the commission, uh, which sees itself as, as best positioned to enforce the DSA when it comes to, to VLOPs. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll return to illegal content, but the focus on disinformation, I think, is, is particularly concerning. First of all, Disinformation is not illegal as such uh, under uh, neither under European um, um, uh, human rights law nor under uh, international human rights law. So, for instance, Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights under um, under uh, the UN standards. So, um, when 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 countering disinformation, you're immediately in uncertain territory because who determines and defines what disinformation is. Um, and I think, again, the, the, the current conflict, Israel-Palestine, shows this. So a number even of, of legacy media outlets reported based on, on, on Palestinian sources that an attack on an, uh, a hospital in Gaza was due to uh, an Israeli strike and that uh, there had been 500 casualties. Um, however, open source intelligence experts uh, have recent have, have raised serious questions about this narrative, and I think um, um, right now the most likely um, explanation is that uh, it was not uh, an Israeli uh, strike. Um, but but this shows the 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 difficulties of establishing uh, what is what what is true or or not, because depending on whether this was an Israeli strike or whether it was a um, a rocket from uh, from a, a Palestinian group that has huge uh, consequences for the narrative surrounding uh, the conflict on uh, on either side, and of course, um, how how well could the European Commission determine the truth of this? This is is a matter that um, <laughs> cannot be authoritatively uh, determined. We may not now know the truth, and and maybe we'll never know the full uh, truth, and so legislating that is uh, deeply uh, problematic. Another thing is is in Ukraine, you know, how do we best counter Russian propaganda, which is a big um, worry for the for, for the commission. The commission published a report um, which which showed its its views on on how to counter disinformation under the DSA. And, and that report suggests that any Kremlin based narrative, even if shared by non Kremlin uh, actors, could uh, be assessed as a systemic risk to be mitigated uh, by, uh, by, by, by VLOPs. Now that's a, again, a very, very broad definition uh, of uh, systemic risks. Uh, and again, one that might have um, collateral damage on the ecosystem of information and opinion, which the commission uh, claims that it wants to uh, protect. Because how do you, how do you counter uh, Russian disinformation and propaganda. Well, again, I would say open source intelligence um, has 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 been uh, at the forefront of this, uh, at, at sort of showing through um, geolocationing using uh, videos uh, from uploaded by Russians and Ukrainians themselves to uh, to counter in real time uh, claims made by by parties to the conflict. Um, and in order to be able to effectively do this. You need the content. Uh, you need the, you need access to the propaganda. 
you need access to what might be lies. Uh, so you need as much information as possible uh, to, to, uh, to, to in, in order to try and create uh, a more reliable narrative rather than deciding on what is truth uh, or, or not and, um, and, and banning it. Um, it is also true that um, the European Union uh, has, um, has um, gone very far in, uh, in, in countering Russian disinformation in, in other ways. Uh, for instance, suspending the broadcast activities of, of state-sponsored uh, Russian media. And uh, the European Commission went so far as to point, point out that social media companies must prevent users from broadcasting any content of RT and, Sp and, and Sputnik. So again, this is this is not this not only this not only um, applies to um, the um, uh, the platforms themselves, but the uses uh, of the uh, platforms. We've also seen that Cherry Breton has suggested, uh, citing the DSA, that social media platforms could face shutdowns if they don't crack down on problematic content during riots in France. Uh, this was a, a, a something that that Breton was then forced to to walk back a bit uh, after pressure from from uh, civil society um so 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 that's uh, one issue when it comes to uh, to disinformation uh, as i mentioned a concept which is not even illegal um but what then uh, about um illegal content from the outset you know if 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 content is illegal why is it problematic if it should be removed and and this is what the dsa envisages with a notice and an action mechanism, um, uh, but I would argue that this um, mechanism can also create uh, issues uh, regarding uh, over-censoring. Uh, so basically the mechanism is aimed to allow any individual or entity to notify uh, providers of hosting services of the presence on their services of specific items of information that the individual or entity considers to be illegal content. Um, now, the illegal content is not defined by the DSA, that is to be defined by national law and uh, European law. The problem with this is that what is illegal um, in the member states varies uh, very, very widely. So if you go to France, for instance, people have been fined for depicting President Macron as a, a Hitler-like figure due to his COVID uh, policies. Um, so someone was fined 10,000 euros for that. Uh, in Italy, currently, an author is facing a defamation lawsuit by uh, the Prime Minister Meloni for calling her uh, something like a bastard, um, something which in many other jurisdictions would be seen as perfectly within the bounds of free speech. But if such, um, if, if, the, if this constitutes uh, illegal content, then from the outset, such content, uh, such content um uh, could and should be removed uh by uh by 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 platforms and um, we also have countries like austria finland and germany where you have blasphemy laws and of course you have countries in the european union that are not necessarily very liberal democratic uh, so victor orban's hungary uh has banned certain forms of quote unquote lgbt uh propaganda so what do you do with that should that be removed uh, as well, um, um, and 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 I would say that um, this creates an incentive again for platforms to um, develop their own terms, um, the, the categories of prohibited contents in their own terms to be broader than uh, than uh, the national law or European human rights uh, standards. Now this is already uh, th this is already uh, happening. Um, um, so my organization has done reports that uh, show that, for instance, on Facebook and YouTube, the content removed there tends to be overwhelmingly legal, lawful uh, content. Uh, we've also uh, this year we uh, we issued a report which showed uh, that which basically tracked the hate speech policies of eight major social media platforms, and we found that all of them had dramatically expanded the scope and protected characteristics uh, in their hate speech policies over the past decade, and that all of them which much went much further than required by human rights standards, and so this. 
Um, these um, reports, empirical reports, I think have the potential to turn things on their head. So if if, if you accept our findings, and, and obviously they, they haven't investigated all platforms in all countries, but they suggest that the real problem might be over removal rather than than platforms removing uh, too little um if you accept that um that, that the, the vast majority of content being removed is is actually lawful um and and so you could argue that if the commission was to take the, the stated uh, commitment to article 11 of the charter seriously it should focus more on content be staying up rather than, than being removed. But that is certainly not the message that the commission is signaling uh, right now. Of course, a lot will depend on how uh, enforcement turns out um, at both at the national and, and at, at the commission level. But 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 certainly now, uh, I, I, I very much worry about uh, the, the, the consequences for free speech. And here, I want to focus on, you know, my big worry is not the consequences for Meta or Google. Um, they have the resources uh, and the incentive to comply. Um, and, and ultimately, their commitment is to their shareholders uh, and maximizing profits. The real losers will be the, the users in the member states who rely on social media to access and impart information without uh, censorship. Now, before I end, I also wanna um, just briefly say that this cannot be looked uh, at isolately, uh, in, in isolation from a European angle, because um, the um, we, we see this um, spreading to a number of countries. I mentioned how the Nets DG uh, was quickly seized upon by countries like uh, Russia, like um, like Venezuela, a number of authoritarian countries that enacted internet uh, sweeping internet censorship and referenced the Net TG as its um, um, as its inspiration. Of course, these countries would still have adopted censorship, but when they were able to reference a law adopted by uh, the most, uh, by the largest and, and most influential European democracy in Germany, it makes it more difficult for democracies to protest against um, uh, these practices, and it provides legitimacy and what I would call what a boundary points um, to uh, a country like Russia. The same is likely to happen for the DSA. It can serve as a blueprint, and and the and the European Union has itself said it's it's a gold standard. But what happens when this kind of law is being uh, adopted, copy pasted uh, in countries that have far less robust protections of free speech, less robust um, standards of the rule of law, separation of powers and so on. We already see this in, in India, for instance, where, um, where the government has cracked down on Facebook uh, and Twitter for failing to comply with government demands for takedowns. We've seen uh, the IT rules from of 2021, um, which um, um, has has been used um, to allow the, in, the Indian government to flag fake or false or misleading information uh, and and require platforms to remove it. And these have been expanded this year. Um, uh, so it allows a fact-checking unit of India's Press Information Bureau. Um, to uh, to require to 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 basically assess whether information is fake or false and uh, and and demand platforms to remove it, and we've also seen uh, worrying develop developments in Brazil, the largest democracy in Latin America, where basically the judiciary has given itself powers to uh, <laughs> identify. Um, fake news uh, and propaganda uh, aimed at democratic institutions, and then to order um, platforms to remove uh, such content. So, uh, a, you know, a, a bit like the what is envisaged with the powers of of, of the European C Commission when it comes to VLOPs, but 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 uh, sort of the DSA on steroids, if you like, and. Um, um, 
what what has, has been proposed is to give these uh, in Brazil uh, these powers even more uh, powers with a with a so-called fake news bill, which which references the DSA and which has been tabled and which would oblige social media platforms to identify and remove illegal content within very very short time frames. Interestingly, when Telegram and Google criticized the, uh, this bill as an attack on freedom of expression, the companies were met um, with demands that they remove this content because, because such an opinion about the, the fake news bill itself constituted uh, um, um, fake news that was illegal <laughs> and, and therefore had to, to, um, to, to be removed. Um, Contrast this with the recent decision in the United States uh, in Missouri versus Biden, where um, uh, uh, um, the Fifth Circuit, um, you know, came to the conclusion that uh, a number of federal agencies, including the White House, the FBI, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, had leaned on social media platforms to remove content, uh, legal content, and 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 this this practice uh, constitute a violation of the First Amendment. Now, this, this decision will go to the Supreme Court, uh, uh, which, and we'll see whether it upholds it uh, or, or changes it. Uh, but I think um, this um, decision, uh, even if it might have gotten some of the facts wrong, is a more promising way forward uh, in ensuring that um, governments don't have the power to put undue pressure on uh, platforms to remove content that they deem undesirable. And unfortunately, I think the DSA is moving in, 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 the, in the direction of politicizing content moderation to the detriment of uh, free speech, and as such will risk undermining democracy, not only in Europe, where at least we have uh, robust um, free speech standards. We have uh, national constitutions, uh, independent courts that can serve as a counteract to this, but also to legitimize similar and much more sweeping uh, bills around the world um, um, from, um, from illiberal democracies like, like India um, and increasingly Brazil, but also in outright authoritarian states who will, who will look at the to the DSA and say, this will, will serve our purposes very well. So those were my initial comments. I, I, I thank you for your patience and I look forward to your questions and comments.